Okay, so year sevens, we're carrying on with our reading of holes. Um, so we'll read for a little while and then there'll be an activity to do afterwards. Remember the story keeps going back to 110 years ago, um, what was going on in the past and we'll see as we go through the story how that's relevant to what's happening with Stanley in the present. 110 years ago, Green Lake was the largest lake in Texas. It was full of clear, cool water and it sparkled like a giant emerald in the sun. It was especially beautiful in the spring when the peach trees which lined the shore bloomed with pink and rose coloured blossoms. There was as always a town picnic on the 4th of July. They'd play games, dance, sing and swim in the lake to keep cool. Prizes were awarded for the best peach pie and peach jam. A special prize was given every year to Miss Catherine Barlow for her fabulous spiced peaches. No one else even tried to make spiced peaches because they knew none could be, could be as delicious as hers. Every summer, Miss Catherine would pick bushels of peaches and preserve them in jars with cinnamon cloves, nutmeg and other spices which she kept secret. The jarred peaches would last all winter. They probably would have lasted a lot longer than that, but they were always eaten by the end of winter. It was said by, that Green Lake was heaven on earth and that Miss Catherine's spiced peaches were the food of the angels. Catherine Barlow was the town's only school teacher. She taught in a w old one-room schoolhouse. It was old even then. The roof leaked, the windows wouldn't open, the door hung crooked on its bent hinges. She was a wonderful teacher, full of knowledge and full of life. The children loved her. She taught classes in the evening for adults, and many of the adults loved her as well. She was very pretty. Her classes were often full of young men who were a lot more interested in the teacher than they were in getting an education. But all they ever got out of it was an education. One such young man was Trout Walker. His real name was Charles Walker, but everyone called him Trout because his two feet smelled like a couple of dead fish. This wasn't entirely Trout's fault. He had an incurable foot fungus. In fact, it was the same fungus that 110 years later would afflict the famous ball player Clyde Livingston. But at least Clyde Livingston showered every day. I take a bath every Sunday morning, Trout would brag, whether I need to or not. Most, in, most everyone in the town expected, expected Miss Catherine to marry Trout Walker. He was the son of the richest man in the county. His family owned most of the peach trees and all the land on the east side of the lake. Trout often showed up at night school, but never paid attention. He talked in class and was disrespectful of the students around him. He was loud and stupid. A lot of men in town were not educated. That didn't bother Miss Catherine. She knew they'd spent most of their lives working on farms and ranches and hadn't had much schooling. That was why she was there, to teach them. But Trout didn't want to learn. He seemed to be proud of his stupidity. How'd you like to take a ride on my new boat this Saturday? He asked her one evening after class. No, thank you, said Miss Catherine. We've got a brand new boat, he said. You don't even have to row it. Yes, I know, said Miss Catherine. Everyone in town had seen and heard the walker's new boat. It made a horrible loud noise and spewed ugly black smoke over the beautiful lake. Trout had always gotten everything he ever wanted. He found it hard to believe that Miss Catherine had turned him down. He pointed his finger at her and said, no one ever says no to, tra to Charles Walker. I believe I just did, said Catherine Barlow. Stanley was half asleep as he got in line for breakfast, but the sight of Mr. Sir awakened him. The left side of Mr. Sir's face had swollen to the size of half a cantaloupe. There were three dark purple jagged lines running down his cheek where the warden had scratched him. The other boys in Stanley's tent had obviously seen Mr. Sir as well, but they had the good sense not to say anything. Stanley put a carton of juice and a plastic spoon on his tray. He kept his eyes down and hardly breathed as Mr. Sir ladled some oatmeal-like stuff into his bowl. He brought his tray to the table. Behind him, a boy from one of the other tents said, Hey, what happened to your face? There was a crash. Stanley turned to see Mr. Sir holding the boy's head against the oatmeal pot. Is something wrong with my face? The boy tried to speak but couldn't. Mr. Sir had him by the throat. 
Does anyone see anything wrong with my face? asked Mr Sir, as he continued to choke the boy. Nobody said anything. Mr Sir let the boy go. His head banged against the table as he fell to the ground. Mr Sir stood over him and asked, How does my face look to you now? A gurgling sound came from the boy's mouth, then he managed to gasp the word, Fine. I'm kind of handsome, don't you think? Yes, Mr Sir. Out on the lake, the other boys asked Stanley what he knew about Mr Sir's face, but he just shrugged and dug his hole. If he didn't talk about it, maybe it would go away. He worked as hard and as fast as he could, not trying to pace himself. He just wanted to get off the lake and get away from Mr Sir as soon as possible. Besides, he knew he'd get a break. Whenever you're ready, just let me know, Zero had said. The first time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr Penlansky. The second time, Mr Sir was driving. No one said anything except, thank you Mr Sir, as he filled each canteen. No one even dared to look at his grotesque face. As Stanley waited, he ran his tongue over the roof of his mouth and inside his cheeks. His mouth was dry and as parched as the lake. The bright sun reflected off the side mirror of, of the truck and Stanley had to shield his eyes with his hand. Thank you, Mr Sir, said Magnet as he took his canteen from him. You thirsty caveman? Mr Sir asked. Yes, Mr Sir, Stanley said, holding his canteen to him. Mr Sir opened the nozzle and the water flowed out of the tank, but it did not go into Stanley's canteen. Instead, he held the canteen right next to the stream of water. Stanley watched the water splatter on the dirt where it was quickly absorbed by the thirsty ground. Mr Sir let the water run for about 30 seconds, then stopped. You want more? he asked. Stanley didn't say anything. Mr Sir turned the water back on and again Stanley watched it pour into the dirt. There, that should be plenty. He handed Stanley his empty canteen. Stanley stared at the dark spot on the ground, which quickly, quickly shrank before his eyes. Thank you, Mr Sir, he said. There was a doctor in the town of Green Lake 110 years ago. His name was Dr Hawthorne, and whenever people got sick, they would go see Doc Hawthorne, but they would also see Sam, the onion man. Onions! Sweet, fresh onions! Sam would call, as he and his donkey, Mary Lou, walked up and down the dirt roads of Green Lake. Mary Lou pulled a cart full of onions. Sam's onion field was somewhere on the other side of the lake. Once or twice a week, he would row across the lake and pick a new batch to fill the cart. Sam had big, strong arms, but it would still take him all day to row across the lake and another day for him to return. Most of the time, he would leave Mary Lou in a shed, which the walkers let him use at no charge. But sometimes he would take Mary Lou on his boat with him. Sam claimed that Mary Lou was almost 50 years old, which was, and still is, extraordinarily old for a donkey. She eats nothing but raw onions, Sam would say, holding up a white onion between his dark fingers. It's nature's magic vegetable. If a person ate nothing but raw onions, he could live to be 200 years old. Sam was not much older than 20, so nobody was quite sure that Mary Lou was really as old as he said she was. She was. How would he know? Still, nobody ever argued with Sam, and wherever they, whenever they were sick, they would go not only to Doc Hawthorne, but also to Sam. Sam always gave the same advice, eat plenty of onions. He said that onions were good for the digestion, the liver, the stomach, the lungs, the heart and the brain. If you don't believe me, just look at old Mary Lou here. She's never been sick a day in her life. He also had many different ointments, lotions, syrups and pastes, all made out of onion juice and different parts of the onion plant. This one cured asthma, that one was for warts and pimples, another was a remedy for arthritis. He even had a special ointment, which he claimed would cure baldness. Just rub it on your husband's head every night when he's sleeping, Mrs Collingwood, and soon his hair will be as thick and as long as Mary Lou's tail. Doc Hawthorne did not resent Sam. The folks of Green Lake were afraid to take chances. They would get regular medicine from Doc Hawthorne and onion concoctions from Sam. After they got over their illness, no one could be sure, not even Doc Hawthorne, which of the two treatments had done the trick. Doc Hawthorne was almost completely bald, and in the morning, his head often smelled like onions. 
Whenever Catherine Barlow bought onions, she always bought an extra one or two and would let Mary Lou eat them out of her hand. Is something wrong? Sam asked her one day as, he, as she was feeding Mary Lou. You seem distracted. Oh, just the weather, said Miss Catherine. It looks like rain clouds moving in. Me and Mary Lou, we like the rain, said Sam. Oh, I like it fine, said Miss Catherine, as she rubbed the donkey's rough hair on top of its head. It's just that the roof leaks in the schoolhouse. I can fix that, said Sam. What are you going to do? Catherine joked. Fill the holes with onion paste? Sam laughed. I'm good with my hands, he told her. I built my own boat. If it leaked, I'd be in big trouble. Catherine couldn't help but notice his strong, firm hands. They made a deal. He agreed to fix the leaky roof in exchange for six jars of spiced peaches. It took Sam a week to fix the roof because he could only work in the afternoons after school let out and before night classes began. Sam wasn't allowed to attend classes because he was a Negro, but they let him fix the building. Miss Catherine usually stayed in the schoolhouse grading papers and such while Sam worked on the roof. She enjoyed what little conversation they were able to have, shouting up and down to each other. She was surprised by his interest in poetry. When he took a break, she would sometimes read a poem to him. On more than one occasion, she would start to read a poem by Poe or Longfellow, only to hear him finish it for, for her from memory. She was sad when the roof was finished. Is something wrong? he asked. No, you did a wonderful job, she said. It's just that the windows won't open. The children and I would enjoy a breeze now and again. I can fix that, said Sam. She gave him two more jars of peaches and Sam fixed the windows. It was easier to talk to him when he was working on the windows. He told her about his secret onion field on the other side of the lake, where the onions grew all year round and the water runs uphill. When the windows were fixed, she complained that her desk wobbled. I can fix that, said Sam. The next time she saw him, she mentioned that the door doesn't hang straight and she got to spend another afternoon with him while he fixed the door. At the end of the first semester, Onion Sam had turned the old run-down schoolhouse into a well-crafted, freshly painted jewel of a building that the whole town was pride up, proud of. People passing by would stop and admire it. That's our schoolhouse. It shows how much we value education here in, in Green Lake. The only person who wasn't happy with it was Miss Catherine. She had run out of things needing to be fixed. She sat at her desk one afternoon listening to the pitter-patter of the rain on the roof. No water leaked into the classroom, except for the few drops that came from her eyes. Onions! Hot sweet onions! Sam called out on the street. She ran to him. She wanted to throw her arms around him, but couldn't bring herself to do it. Instead, she hugged Mary Lou's neck. Is something wrong? he asked her. Oh, Sam, she said. My heart is breaking. I can fix that, said Sam. She turned to him. He took hold of both of her hands and kissed her. Because of the rain, there was nobody else out on the street. Even if there was, Catherine and Sam wouldn't have noticed. They were lost in their own world. At that moment, however, Hattie Parker stepped out of the general store. They didn't see her, but she saw them. She pointed her quivering finger in their direction and whispered, God will punish you. There were no telephones, but word spread quickly through the small town. By the end of the day, everyone in Green Lake had heard that the school teacher had kissed the onion picker. Not one child showed up for school the next morning. Miss Catherine sat alone in the classroom and wondered if she had lost track of the day of the week. Perhaps it was Saturday. It wouldn't have surprised her. Her brain and heart had been spinning ever since Sam kissed her. She heard a noise outside the door, then suddenly a mob of men and women came storming into the school building. They were led by Trout Walker. There she is, Trout shouted, the devil woman. The mob was turning over desks and ripping down bulletin boards. She's been poisoning your children's brains with books, Trout declared. They began piling all the books in the centre of the room. Think about what you're doing, cried Miss Catherine. Someone made a grab for her, tearing her dress, but she managed to get out of the building. She ran to the sheriff's office. The sheriff had his feet up on the desk and was drinking from a bottle of whiskey. 
Morning, Miss Catherine, he said. They're destroying the schoolhouse, she said, gasping for breath. They'll burn it to the ground if someone doesn't stop them. Just calm your pretty self down a second, the sheriff said in a slow drawl. Tell me what you're talking about. He got up from his desk and walked over to her. Trow Walker has... Now don't go saying nothing bad about Charles Walker, said the sheriff. We don't have much time, urged Catherine. You've got to stop them. You're sure pretty, said the sheriff. Miss Catherine stared at him in horror. Kiss me, said the sheriff. She slapped him across the face. He laughed. You kissed the onion picker. Why won't you kiss me? She tried to slap him again, but he caught her by the hand. She tried to wriggle free. You're drunk, she yelled. I always get drunk before a hanging. Hanging? Who? It's against the law for a Negro to kiss a white woman. Well, then you'll have to hang me too, said Catherine, because I kissed him back. It ain't against the law for you to kiss him, the sheriff explained, just for him to kiss you. We're all equal under the eyes of God, she declared. The sheriff laughed. Then if Sam and I are equal, why won't you kiss me? He laughed again. I'll make you a deal. One sweet kiss and I won't hang your boyfriend. I'll just run him out of town. Miss Catherine jerked her hand free. As she hurried to the door, she heard the sheriff say, the law will punish Sam and God will punish you. She stepped back into the street and saw smoke rising from the schoolhouse. She ran down to the lakefront where Sam was hitching Mary Lou to the onion cart. Thank God I found you, she said, hugging him. We've got to get out of here, now. What? Someone must have seen us kissing yesterday, she said. They set fire to the schoolhouse. The sheriff said he's going to hang you. Sam hesitated for a moment, as if he couldn't quite believe it. He didn't want to believe it. Come on, Mary Lou. We have to leave Mary Lou behind said Catherine. Sam stared at her for a moment. There were tears in his eyes. Okay. Sam's boat was in the water, tied to a tree by a long rope. He untied it and they waded through the water and climbed aboard. His powerful arms rowed them away from the shore, but his powerful arms were no match for Trout Walker's motorised boat. They were little more than halfway across the lake when Miss Catherine heard a loud roar of the engine. Then she saw the ugly black smoke. These are the facts. The walker boat smashed into Sam's boat. Sam was shot and killed in the water. Catherine Barlow was rescued against her wishes. When they returned to the shore, she saw Mary Lou's body lying on the ground. The donkey had been shot in the head. That all happened 110 years ago. Since then, not one drop of rain has fallen on Green Lake. You make the decision. Whom did God punish? Three days after Sam's death, Miss Catherine shot the sheriff while he was sitting in his chair drinking a cup of coffee. Then she carefully applied a fresh coat of red lipstick and gave him the kiss he had asked for. For the next 20 years, kissing Kate Barlow was one of the most feared outlaws in all the West. Stanley dug his shovel into the ground. His hole was about three and a half feet deep in the centre. He grunted as he pried up some dirt, then flung it off to the side. The sun was almost directly overhead. He glanced at his canteen lying beside his hole. He knew it was half full, but he didn't take a drink just yet. He had to drink sparingly because he didn't know who would be driving the water truck the next time it came. Three days had passed since the warden had scratched Mr Sir. Every time Mr Sir delivered water, he poured Stanley's straight onto the ground. Fortunately, Mr Pendansky delivered the water more often than Mr Sir. Mr Pendansky was obviously aware of what Mr Sir was doing, because he always gave Stanley a little extra. He'd fill Stanley's canteen, then let Stanley take a long drink, then top it off for him. It helped, too, that Zero was digging some of Stanley's hole for him. Although as Stanley as it expected, the other boys didn't like to see Stanley sitting around while they were working. They'd say things like, Who died and made you king? Or, It must be nice to have your own personal slave. When he tried pointing out that he was the one who took the blame for the sunflower seeds, the other boys said it was his fault because he was the one who spilled them. 
I risked my life for those seeds, Magnet had said, and all I got was one lousy handful. Stanley had also tried to explain that he needed to save his energy so he could teach Zero how to read, but the other boys just mocked him. Same old story, ain't it, Armpit? X-Ray had said. The white boy sits around while the black boy does all the work. Ain't that right, caveman? No, that's not right, Stanley replied. No, it ain't, Zero X-Ray agreed. It ain't right at all. Stanley dug out another shovel full of dirt. He knew X-Ray wouldn't have been talking like that if he was the one teaching Zero to read. Then X-Ray would be talking about how important it was that he got his rest, right? So he could be a better teacher, right? And that was true. He did need to save the strength so he could be a better teacher. Although Zero was a quick learner. Sometimes, in fact, Stanley hoped the warden was watching them with her secret cameras and microphones so she knew that Zero wasn't as stupid as everyone thought. From across the lake, he could see the approaching dust cloud. He took a drink from his canteen, then waited to see who was driving the truck. The swelling on Mr. Sir's face had gone down, but it was still a little puffy. There had been three scratch marks down his cheek. Two of the marks had faded, but the middle scratch must have been the deepest, because it still remained. It was a jagged purple line running from below his eye to below his mouth, like a tattoo of a scar. Stanley waited in line, then handed him his canteen. Mr. Sir held it up to his ear and shook it. He smiled at the swishing sound. Stanley hoped he wouldn't dump it out. To his surprise, Mr. Sir held the canteen under the stream of water and filled it. Wait here, he said. Still holding Stanley's canteen, Mr. Sir walked past him and went round to the side of the truck and into the cab where he couldn't be seen. What's he doing in there? asked Zero. I wish I knew, said Stanley. A short while later, Mr. Sir came out of the truck and handed Stanley his canteen. It was still full. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Mr. Sir smiled at him. What are you waiting for? he asked. Drink up. He popped some sunflower seeds into his mouth, chewed and spit out the shells. Stanley was afraid to drink it. He hated to think what kind of vile substance Mr. Sir might have put in it. He brought the canteen back to his hole. For a long time, he left it beside his hole as he continued to dig. Then, when he was so thirsty he could hardly stand it any more, he unscrewed the cap, turned the canteen over and poured it all out onto the dirt. He was afraid that if he'd waited another second, he might have taken a drink. After Stanley taught Zero the final six letters of the alphabet, he taught him to write his name. Capital Z E R O. Zero wrote the letters as Stanley said them. Zero, he said, looking at his piece of paper. His smile was too big for his face. Stanley watched him write it over and over again. Zero, 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 zero. In a way, it made him sad. He couldn't help but think that a hundred times zero was still nothing. You know, that's not my real name, Zero said, as they headed to the rec room for dinner. Well, yeah, Stanley said, I guess I knew that. He'd never really been sure. Everyone's always called me Zero, even before I came here. Oh, okay. My real name is Hector. Hector, Stanley repeated. Hector Zeroni. So have a think about where we've heard that name before, Zeroni. After 20 years, Kate Barlow returned to Green Lake. It was a place where nobody would ever find her, a ghost town on a ghost lake. The peach trees had all died and there were a couple of small oak trees growing it by an old abandoned cabin. The cabin used to be on the eastern shore of the lake. Now the edge of the lake was over five miles away and it was little more than a small pond full of dirty water. She lived in the cabin. Sometimes she could hear Sam's voice echoing across the emptiness. Onions! Sweet fresh onions! She knew she was crazy. She knew she'd been crazy for the last 20 years. Oh, Sam, she would say, speaking into the vast emptiness. I know it's hot, but I feel so very cold. My hands are cold, my feet are cold, my face is cold, my heart is cold. 
and sometimes she would hear him say, I can fix that, and she'd feel his warm arm across her shoulders. She'd been living in the cabin about three months when she was awakened one morning by someone kicking open the cabin door. She opened her eyes to see the blurry end of a rifle two inches from her nose. She could smell Trout Walker's dirty feet. You've got exactly ten seconds to tell me where you've hidden your loot, said Trout, or else I'll blow your head off. She yawned. A red-headed woman was there with Trout. Kate could see her rummaging through the cabin, dumping drawers and knocking things from the shelves of cabinets. The woman came to her. Where is it? she demanded. Linda Miller? asked Kate. Is that you? Linda Miller had been in the fourth grade when Kate Barlow was still a teacher. She'd been a cute, freckle-faced girl with beautiful red hair. Now her face was blotchy and her hair was dirty and scraggly. It's Linda Walker now, said Trout. Oh, Linda, I'm so sorry, said Kate. Trout jabbed her throat with the rifle. Where's the loot? There is no loot, said Kate. Don't give me that, shouted Trout. You've robbed every bank from here to Houston. You'd better tell him, said Linda. We're desperate. You married him for his money, didn't you? asked Kate. Linda nodded. But it's all gone. It dried up with the lake, the peach trees, the livestock. I kept thinking it has to rain soon. The drought can't last forever. But it just kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Her eyes fixed on the shovel, which was leaning up against the fireplace. She's buried it, she declared. I don't know what you're talking about, said Kate. There was a loud blast as Trout fired his rifle just above her head. The window behind her shattered. Where's it buried? he demanded. Go ahead and kill me, Trout, said Kate. But I sure hope you like to dig, because you're going to be digging for a long time. It's a big, vast wasteland out there. You and your children and their children can dig for the next hundred years and you'll never find it. Linda grabbed Kate's hair and jerked her head back. Oh, we're not going to kill you, she said. But by the time we're finished with you, you're going to wish you were dead. I've been wishing I was dead for the last 20 years, said Kate. They dragged her out of bed and pushed her outside. She wore blue silk pyjamas. Her turquoise studded black boots remained by her bed. They loosely tied her legs together so she could walk, but she couldn't run. They made her walk barefoot on the hot ground. They wouldn't let her stop walking. Not until you take us to the loot, said Trout. Linda hit Kate on the back of her legs with a shovel. You're going to take us to it sooner or later, so you might as well make it sooner. She walked one way then the other until her feet were black and blistered. Whenever she stopped, Linda whacked her with the shovel. I'm losing my patience, warned Trout. She felt the shovel jab into her back and she fell onto hard dirt. Get up, Linda ordered. Kate struggled to her feet. We're being easy on you today, said Trout. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse for you until you take us to it. Look out, shouted Linda. A lizard leapt toward them. Kate could see its big red eyes. Linda tried to hit it with a shovel and Trout shot at it, but they both missed. The lizard landed on Kate's bare ankle. Its sharp black teeth bit into her leg. Its white tongue lapped up the droplets of blood that leaked out of the wound. Kate smiled. There was nothing they could do to her anymore. Start digging, she said. Where is it? Linda screeched. Where'd you bury it? Trout demanded. Kate Barlow died laughing. So that's as much as we're going to read today. Uh, the activity I'd like to have a go at doing, obviously this story is written in a third person perspective, using the words he and she, so it's on looking um, from a, an outsider's point of view of what's going on with Stanley's life and 110 years ago in Green Lake. What I'd like you to have a go at doing, if you think about the section that we've just read, um, Trout Walker is quite a prominent character. He seemed like he, he was quite keen on Catherine Walker when she was a school teacher. Um, sorry, Catherine Barlow when she was a school teacher. And then he, after he found out what happened between her and Sam, 
He was the one who was um, setting the schoolhouse on fire and in that last section he is now trying to get her to tell him where she's buried all the loot, all the jewels and things that she's robbed from people over the last 20 years. So what I might you to have a go at doing is rewriting a section of this story from Trout Walker's point of view. So you're going to be telling the story in the first person instead of the third person. So for example, you could start off with something like I used to think that Catherine Barlow was a fine woman, but now things have changed. So you're writing as if you're Trout Walker and telling part of this story from his point of view. You should have a go at doing that for about 10 to 15 minutes. Off you go.